Joining us now is Dr. Susie Green. Uh, Dr. Green is a registered clinical and coaching psychologist and a member of the Australian Psychological Society based in Sydney. She is a leader and pioneer in coaching psychology and positive psychology, having conducted a world first study on evidence based life coaching. Dr. Green is an adjunct lecturer at the Coaching Psychology Unit, University of Sydney, and teaches applied positive psychology. She's also the co-founder of the Positive Psychology Institute and also a resident expert for the Australian Women's Health magazine and writes a regular stressless column. So could you please get those hands clapping and welcome to the stage who's going to speak about positive psychology coaching, optimising your potential, Dr Susie Green. Good afternoon, everybody. How's everybody feeling? Positive, that's the correct answer, well done. And it is that time of the afternoon, so um, I'm really trying to draw on my top character strength of zest, energy and vitality, and two cups of coffee certainly helps <laughs> with that. So um, thank you so much for having me here uh, this year to speak at the conference. Um, some of you may have been to see me in previous years where I've actually been thrown in the deep end and I filled in last year for Tal Ben Shahar with about, I think, 10 hours notice. Um, so it's really exciting to be here this year presenting to you and presenting to you on two topics that actually the combination of two fields that I'm very passionate about and that being the fields of positive psychology and the field of coaching psychology. Um, my background, as you would have heard, is in clinical psychology. My first um, position as a, as a psychologist was working with a group of psychiatrists down in the Illawarra, not far down the south coast, and I realised relatively early that that wasn't uh, utilising my strength as such, and I admire people that do that sort of work, but really my strength and my calling was in proactive mental health strategies. So you could imagine when I came across the fields of positive psychology and coaching psychology, how excited I was. So um, I actually teach applied positive psychology in the coaching psychology unit at the University of Sydney. So that's my specialty, is the application of positive psychology within a coaching psychology framework. So this year, I've actually been to two international conferences. The first one was the International Positive Psychology Congress in Philadelphia which is a very big and exciting conference that's held um, and sponsored by uh, University of Pennsylvania and Martin Seligman. Um, and the other conference I've just returned from is, was in Barcelona, which was part of the International Coaching Psychology Congress. And um, I'm very proud because uh, coaching psychology, if you've ever heard me speak before, you will know that it was founded here in Australia. So we are the leaders and the world experts in coaching psychology. But as I said, um, being over in, over in Europe, coaching psychology is taking off in Europe at the moment, which is very exciting. But two of my key observations from Philadelphia and, at Philadelphia and Barcelona is that in Philadelphia at Positive Psychology at the Congress, there weren't many people talking about coaching psychology. And then when I was in Barcelona, when I asked um, the audience who's heard about positive psychology, there were only a few hands that went up. Now, what you'll hear today, and I only have 20 minutes, so it's always a challenge, luckily I speak fast, um, is that they are complementary fields. They're actually perfect partners, and we really need more integration of both of these fields, and uh, that's what I'm here to talk about today. So, um, my aims are to introduce you to both of those fields briefly, and hopefully to give you a rationale as to why you might consider uh, positive psychology coaching either for yourself um, for your family, uh, for your staff, potentially. And I guess positive psychology coaching, for me, is a proactive mental health strategy. So here in Australia, unfortunately, we're not like in New York where people brag about seeing their therapists yet, unfortunately, but it's okay to see a coach, you know? People are more than happy to go and see a coach. Um, and I guess in my doctoral research, we found that 52% of people coming along for a life coaching intervention had significantly high levels of psychological distress, which is a bit of a concern for us as psychologists in particular, because some of those people that have gone off for life coaching actually probably need therapy. So um, that's something that we need to bear in mind. It's still a relatively new field of coaching and coaching psychology. One of my colleagues, uh, Travis Kemp, has collected some data on an executive coaching uh, sample, and 38% of executives turning up for executive coaching 
also reporting significantly high levels of psychological distress. So it is a field that we need to be mindful of that therapy, um, you know, that therapy coaching overlap. So you've probably heard the term, most of you that are here um, have, would have heard the term positive psychology. Uh, my business partner and I spend most of our days doing what we call myth busting uh, in terms of positive psychology, clarifying what it is and what it's not. Um, one of the biggest myths that we consistently bust is that it's a happyology. Now, that was fantastic when it made front cover of Time magazine, um, not so fantastic when it's being criticised and I guess the suggestion that it's normal to be happy all the time when, as we've heard many times at these conferences, that happiness is just one of the human emotions and the other emotions like fear, anger and sadness are you know, part of our repertoire of emotions. So we're certainly not saying that you need to get rid of those emotions completely, but we need to understand them, we need to be able to talk about them, we need to be able to manage them. But I can tell you now, as a psychologist, and particularly as a clinical psychologist, in my training, I was only ever taught about fear, anger and sadness. I was never taught about joy or serenity or gratitude um, or happiness. So it's really only been in the last 10 years that psychologists have actually started to scientifically investigate the positive emotions. So that's quite exciting. So the term is actually an umbrella term. Um, we've come this morning from a presentation to the Australian Heads of Independent Schools. There's huge interest in positive psychology and coaching in the education sector. And again, we did some myth-busting this morning that it's not about happiness, it's an umbrella term that encompasses a whole range of topics like wisdom, creativity, meaning, forgiveness, you know, and a lot of these concepts have been around for millennia, but what we haven't had is the scientific research to investigate them and to understand them. Um, many of you will be familiar with the concept of self-actualization. Anyone that did undergrad psych and learnt about the humanistic psychologists uh, Carl Rogers, Abraham Maslow, will know that these terms are not new. Again, what positive psychology has done in the last 10 years is to bring scientific rigour to the investigation of some of these topics. Positive psych is also the study, scientific study of the virtues and the strengths, a character strength in particular. And again, been around for thousands and thousands of years, but there's been no scientific investigation of what they are how to understand them, how to deliberately cultivate them as well. So that's a very big area of research. And as I mentioned, positive emotions, particularly Barbara Fredrickson, which many of you may have heard speak. I think she's back again next year. If you get an opportunity to hear her speak, please take it. She's absolutely brilliant and she is a world leader in understanding from a scientific perspective the different positive emotions that we can experience and how to cultivate them rather than the usual sex, drugs and rock and roll path. And for me, one of the most important concepts of positive psychology that hasn't had enough scientific airplay is meaning and purpose. Um, and many of you will know Seligman articulated early on the three roads to the good life, which he's expanded on this year. But those three roads being the pleasurable life, the engaged life, and the meaningful life. One of my colleagues took a, a large sample of adolescents' approaches to happiness, how well they were travelling the pleasurable, the engaged, and the meaningful life. No surprises, very high on pleasure, medium levels of engagement, and very low levels of meaning and purpose. So with increasing um, rates of de particularly depression and anxiety, it's not surprising, you know, that that they do lack a sense of meaning and purpose in their lives. Um, I was also talking to a group of uh, public school principals not that long ago, and when I spoke to them about the importance of purpose and meaning, and in, particularly in an educational setting, one of them turned to the rest of them and said, where on earth do we have these conversations in our school day? And they sat there and reflected, I guess, for quite a while, and they came to the consensus that there was really no space within the public education, um, I guess, timetable to have these sorts of conversations. And I think that's something that we need to address, our public education system needs to address. Within the private sector, there tends to be uh, pastoral care programs, social justice programs. From our perspective, there seems to be more opportunity within the private sector to have these discussions, but less so in the public. But so important. 
So you will also have heard the term flourishing before, and that's a term that's used a lot in positive psychology. Um, and, and I guess some of the research has found that there's only a small percentage of the population that can be considered flourishers. So these are people that report low levels of mental illness on measures of mental illness and high levels of mental health. Um, as you can see from that uh, display, the majority of people sit in the moderately mentally healthy, and that's not too bad. You'll also see that there's the languishers. So these are the people that don't fit criteria for a DSM-4 diagnosis, particularly of depression, but they're certainly not functioning um, as well as they could be. And these are people that could potentially be subclinically depressed as well. These are the people that probably wouldn't go and see a psychologist either, still because of the stigma. Um, so I guess what we're trying to do is to move everybody up just a little bit on that spectrum, just a little bit. Although in saying this, at the moment, from a clinical perspective, we don't have a lot of research on the application of positive psychology for clinical populations. Um, one of my uh, colleagues has done a study over at St John of God and utilised it with a, uh, an outpatient population. And some of the strategies, um, like gratitude, worked well. For other uh, participants, it didn't work so well at all. So again, we still need a lot more research on the applications of positive psych in a clinical population. It's really targeted at the languishing, the moderately mentally healthy. And you've probably seen this um, before. This is Sonia Lubomirsky, Ken Sheldon's research that they found that in terms of the factors that impact on our well-being, 50% approximately is genetically inherited. There's 10% life circumstances and 40% intentional activities. So this is how we spend our day, the sorts of things that we do in our day, the sorts of attitudes that we have. So I guess this is where coaching psychology comes in, because it's one thing to go to a conference like this and take copious notes and really learn lots of information, but what normally happens is we all go back to our daily lives, we put our notes in a folder, and not much ever changes. So the role of the coach or the coaching psychologist is to actually take that knowledge and put it into action. This is a definition that we use within the Australian Psychological Society. We actually describe coaching psychology as an applied positive psychology. It's the systematic application of behavioural science. So what underpins coaching psychology? Years and years of research that we know as psychologists that helps people to understand how to go through the process of behavioural change. And it's not just about goal attainment, it's very much about increasing wellbeing. So evidence-based coaching, that's how we differentiate, I guess, coaching from the type of coaching that we teach at Sydney Uni. Um, the coaching that we utilise has an evidence base underpinning it. It is a collaborative relationship. So um, the relationship is a big predictor in therapeutic outcomes, and some of the research now in coaching is that it's the it's actual coaching relationship that leads to um, the outcomes, not so much the different strategies that we use. And of course, goals underpin coaching. So there are goals in coaching, but there's a differentiation between goal setting, which many people are not too bad at, if you think about New Year's resolutions. It's the goal striving process that people have difficulties with when you think about New Year's resolutions and people falling off the wagon. So for me, the biggest or the most important strength of coaching is the goal striving, having somebody checking in with you reminding you why you're going through this process of change, encouraging you, drawing on your strengths. You know, it's, it is like a cheer, cheerleader, if you like, with you through that process of change. And it is to facilitate accelerated goal attainment. Why we think that we should be able to make these changes by ourselves continues to, to surprise me. Self-regulation as a strength, if you've ever done the VIA, uh, the research shows it is the most commonly occurring in people's bottom five character strengths. So we all think we should be self-regulated and be able to stay on track with our goals, but the research says that's not the case. So both of those fields um, have complementary approaches. They're both about optimal functioning, they're both about enhanced performance, both about enhanced psychological well-being, and they both focus on strengths and solutions. They both have desired outcomes, positive human functioning, achievement of optimal health and well-being, and psychological well-being, not just happiness. So what does the research say? 
Now, I haven't got a lot of time left to talk about this, but at the moment, we've got a whole lot of research that shows evidence-based coaching leads to increases not only in goal attainment, but well-being, and I've done three randomised controlled trials on evidence-based coaching to support that. And we've also got a meta-analysis that was conducted by uh, Sonia Lubomirsky, actually, that shows a whole range of these positive psychology interventions, such as kindness and gratitude and strengths use and forgiveness, that they also lead to increases in well-being. So which path do you take? Do you take the positive psych intervention path or do you take the coaching path? I guess our argument is, is that you try and combine both those paths. And in fact, this is the study that we're currently doing over at North Sydney Girls High and North Sydney Boys High, where we were very fortunate enough to get a Harvard research grant to compare evidence-based coaching with a positive psych intervention for a year 11 population. It was teacher trained and teacher facilitated. I sat in on some of the, uh, uh, the programs and the teachers have done an amazing job with the students. So we have the, the programs actually finished, but we haven't finished the data analysis. So please stay posted for that. So positive psych coaching is the integration of both the, what we know about positive psychology, and as I said, that umbrella term of all those different topics, but using coaching, particularly the relationship as a framework and as a methodology to apply what we know from positive psychology. And why? As I said before, takeaway from training is about, they quote, four to 10%. So again, if you were looking to invest in some training for yourself in positive psychology, for your school, for your organization, there's really no point investing in it unless you've got some process or framework in place to monitor the sustainability or the transfer of that training. And that's where the coaching really comes to the fore. Why do I really need to say why? Both of those strategies, positive psych, coaching psych, particularly the integration, is about increasing well-being and decreasing mental illness. It's also for the languishers. And again, think about our adolescent populations. We have a large-scale study, the world's first scientifically investigated positive education program running at Knox Grammar School at the moment with the University of Wollongong. So we've taken a baseline of the staff and the students, the whole school. We're going to be doing a large-scale strategic program. We've trained nearly 200 staff now at Knox Grammar. The staff have absolutely loved it. And next year, it will start to be rolled out to the students. So again, um, we need more research, but it is coming along. Therapy versus coaching. Um, in our offices in the Sydney CBD, we actually provide the service to assess, you know, whether you would be best suited in a therapeutic intervention or whether you're actually coach ready or coach fit. Um, and I think that's an important distinction. And particularly being mindful of, you know, the, the professional that might be working with you, whether you might need somebody that has professional training in therapy. When would you use positive psychology coaching? Um, well, I don't have many people coming in to see me that are extremely satisfied with their lives, um, but usually the people that are a little bit uh, slightly dissatisfied, some people extremely dissatisfied, but often in, when we're looking at particular transitions in our life, uh, career coaching, why on earth do people leave it to go for couples counselling? Why aren't they getting couples coaching much more proactively? So again, it's about taking a much more proactive approach to our lives. And rather than waiting for the dramas and the stresses, the traumas to occur, and then going and getting some assistance, it's going early and looking at these things much earlier on. And who should provide this service? Um, I do have a bee in my bonnet about this. The life coaching industry, the coaching industry is not regulated at this point in time. Anybody can call themselves a coach. Um, with those stats that I quoted to you previously, that is a concern for us. Standards Australia have just released standards for workplace coaching, so we are starting to see some sophistication um, in the workplace coaching, but life coaching is still an area that I would ask lots and lots of questions in terms of education and training and background and experience before I engaged a life coach. So what now? 20 minutes goes like this, doesn't it? Um, definitely read more. Uh, we have a resource list if you'd like to email us. We have some suggested readings, uh, TED videos. There's great stuff that's available. It doesn't have to cost a lot of money. Uh, we have an e-news. Uh, we've got about 2,600 people on that now. We'll send out little bits of information on positive psych and coaching psych. 
Um, consider some positive site coaching for yourselves, potentially, and come to some of the conferences. We have the third Australian Positive Psychology Conference uh, being hosted by my alma mater, University of Wollongong, next year in March. Um, I think it's, at, it's on a, at a slightly different time to the Happiness and Its Causes Conference, um, but there'll be some fantastic uh, speakers at that conference as well. So for more information, if you're interested, I, I hear from my presentations at these conferences we get students, more and more students coming through the University of Sydney, um, but also our business in the city, we also have lots of um, uh, services and lots of uh, information we're very happy to share as well. So hopefully we'll see you soon. Thank you very much.